Good evening. It's good to be with you. Thanks for the invite to be here. I'm glad you're here. As, as I've always said over the years, so much better talking when there's somebody there uh, that can hear it and uh, perhaps even give some feedback if you want. Um, is that going to be okay? Put the lights? Okay. Um, I, I, first, the disclaimer. Um, I'm going to talk more about maybe the philosophy of science than I am about any kind of discoveries or any special topic and, and so forth. And uh, I have to also admit, uh, I spent about 20 years in the college classroom in the field of biology. Um, but for the last 30 years, God called me into evangelism and into Bible teaching and into the areas of discipleship and so forth. And I'm president of Base Search International uh, offices in Edina uh, here in the Twin Cities. Um, so I'm not a practicing scientist at this point and I'm not a philosopher. So you're in for a real treat tonight. I oftentimes, uh, I've been here before, it's been a few years now, but I've spoken to GCCSA a, a number of times. And uh, uh, I always come with the, I guess, the humility of the rhyme. There once was a man named Nesser who came to know lesser and lesser. And finally, one fall, he knew nothing at all. And they made him a college professor. <laughs> there are any professors here, I, I apologize. I don't, uh, it's a joke. Uh, <laughs> My theme tonight is, is based on the response of Jesus to the Sadducees, um, obviously applied differently. Um, the Sadducees, of course, were a group uh, at the time of Jesus who did not believe in uh, resurrection, life after death. And of course, that's why they're, they're, they're Sadducees. Um, two, two reasons that uh, Jesus gave for their unbelief is because they had, they knew neither God nor the power of God or the scriptures or the power of God is the, uh, uh, let me go into that one there. You're mistaken because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. And I'm gonna be showing you a, a Christian biblical view of knowledge. And this is going to apply to that. Um, why? Because I think as a scientist, uh, way back, science made a fatal decision. And I'll talk about that just in a, in a few moments that had put them on a track that had to eventually lead to a dead end. Um, and uh, not knowing that, of course, uh, I'm, I'm looking at it in hindsight, uh, and we will we'll analyze it. And then at the end, I want you to interact and ask questions if you, if you would like to. You see, back in 1933 already, the secular humanists had published their um, a, a uh, no, why did they have everything laid out? They published a humanist manifesto, one. And then of course later they, man, they did humanist manifesto two, and then more recently there's humanist manifesto three. And of course what you find is that they, they I'm quoting from it here, uh, we find insufficient evidence for belief in the existence of a supernatural. See, this is going to be a domino effect. This is the first very big issue that takes place throughout our society, which of course becomes pulling the rug right out from any possibility of rational thought as soon as you do this. But it's either meaningless, they said in their manifesto here, or it's irrelevant to the question of survival and fulfillment of the human race. As atheists, we begin with humans, not God with nature and not deity. 
So you're already there in their position, realize then that if you're going to eliminate God, all you have left are us, the humans, or you have nature, you have the universe, it has to be your God. And so you have the groundwork for human and secular humanism and scientific naturalism because you've eliminated uh, the possibility of, of God. So their position, of course, is that God is non-existent. Jesus would say to them, you are mistaken. A European poll taken not so long ago in which they asked what they, whether they believe in the existence of God and uh, I was rather appalled when I, I saw the results of that poll. Uh, in France, only 27% of the people believe in the existence of God, according to this poll. Uh, they went to the United Kingdom, 37%, and Germany, 44%. And you have to ask the question, is that where we are heading uh, in, in the United States? Uh, well, perhaps that's pretty evident. Uh, 30 years ago, we had about 92% of the people in the United States on the poll believed in God. Uh, just recently, it was down to 60%. So imagine that in our culture and in our society, 40% of the people don't even think God exists. And you begin to have some answers as to the direction that our society and our culture is going the minute you take that out of, out of the way. And then some of them, of course, even get fairly aggressive about their position, right? The Minnesota Atheists, the, the uh, Atheist.org, uh, put up uh, outdoor advertising for the position of atheism. And so they kind of turn to maybe a bit of evangelism <laughs> uh, in order to get their position out. The Bible has something to say about that tendency, that direction our culture and society has gone. Romans chapter one, very familiar to all of us here, 18 through 20. That which, we, which may be known of God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities and his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen having understood or being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. As you know, that without excuse is the word apologia, which means they have no case. They have no reason. They're without support in their denial of the existence of God. In other words, the scripture makes it clear that God intended that there be no possibility of atheism. You have to become a denier in order to become an atheist because the evidence is fully, is fully seen and, and understandable. So the Christian position would be, the worldview would be that God is evident in nature, although we have to be quick to point out that nature can never, cannot tell us who God is. Only that a divine or superior intelligence does exist. And the argument for nature can be supported for Muslims and for Hindus and for anybody who's theistic, they use nature to point to as the evidence that for their position. Uh, we have to go to other sources of revelation to find out who it is. Um, and the diagram, to, to try to, I'm going to build the entire evening around this diagram and what has happened and where science has gone awry. Um, in, the, in the Christian view of knowledge, we have, of course, divine revelation. And, you know, some of you are sitting there looking at me and saying, but, but that's not science. Well, we'll get to that <laughs> because that's because of science's definition not because there is no such thing as knowledge. It's, it's the methodology that, that's going to cut this out. And so God has revealed himself in the creation. It's very basic. 
and through special revelation the Bible and through personal revelation Jesus Christ. Notice then that the creation, the way I've set up the diagram, is really originating as divine revelation, but it really is in the world. Notice the dotted line. Everything is going to be built around that. What's above the dotted line, what's below the dotted line. Because the idea was that God was revealed so that he would inform human observation and human experimentation. Of what? In a broad sweep of things, humanity, the universe, and time the third dimension or history, if you prefer, all would be informed by the three lines of God's revelation. And of course, as a result, we were to have social science classes, we were to have natural science, we were to have historical studies, we were to have the geological studies, and you can go on and name the rest of the areas within the university. The assumption was that there would be integration between what comes to us from above the dotted line and what's available to us through the lower level, observation and experimentation. If in fact, you cut off the upper level, you now make a fatal mistake because you're left with, and I'll, I'll add something to this in, in just a bit, you, you are un unable to deal with uh, the arrival of truth. You suddenly lose antithesis. <laughs> you lose absolutes. Everything becomes relevant, uh, uh, relative, and, uh, and so forth. Uh, let me, in regard to the revelation, let me let, try to give you a couple of examples here. In, in, in Acts chapter 17, you recall, uh, the Mars Hill uh, address recorded by the Apostle Paul. And, and if you recall, he went there and he stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious in all respects. I don't know exactly where they got their religious intuition and sources, but I'm suggesting they got it from natural revelation. That they are religious because the world communicates in every language, in every culture, in every geography, no matter where you are, it's speaking loud and clear about the existence of God. But he, he, he goes on and, and says, for while I was uh, passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I found one with an altar with an inscription to an unknown God. Well, my, my, my point of bringing this up is through natural revelation, you really can't identify who God is. Therefore, throughout history, we've had people simply making up names to represent what they know is deity from natural revelation. But they don't have a name. They don't know who it is. And so when I spent a number of years uh, speaking in India, some of the Indians would boast to me that they have 300,000 names for God. That's amazing. That's probably because they don't have knowledge of God's personal revelation in Jesus Christ. They don't have knowledge of his special revelation in the Bible. Therefore, only in those sources can you figure out who it is. Um, and, and so that's why Paul at the end comes on. He says, he says, this God's going to re reveal himself because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world um, in righteousness to a man whom he has a, uh, appointed, having um, forgiven, or excuse me, having uh, forestalled proof, uh, provided proof of all men by raising him from the dead. I love the fact that the... Uh, Lights are down, but I'm having trouble with the darkness <laughs> reading my, there's a little text of the Bible here. Uh, so what he did is appeal to the person of Jesus and the resurrection in history, which it, it, the point is he's appealing to divine revelation 
in order to communicate with them who God is. The, the same thing is, is true in, in, in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2, in which the, the writer says, God, after he spoke long ago in the fathers to the uh, prophets in many uh, ways and, and so forth, he goes on and says in verse 2, in these last days, he has spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed through all things, through whom he made the world. So everything about the Christian worldview and the Christian view of knowledge is going to revolve around the ways in which God tries to get our attention through the creation, through his son, Jesus Christ, and through scripture, his revelation in that particular way. By denying God's existence and God's revelation, all academia is limited to the knowledge knowable below the dotted line. On that basis alone, it's impossible for them to truly understand humanity or the universe or history for that matter. Millions of students around the world are taking courses and getting degrees. But what they're learning is based on limited knowledge, oftentimes misleading, in fact, wrong knowledge. I know I'm being very bold here, um, but how would you teach humanity? without the revelation of man's fall and sin? How would you ever understand the, the ge geology without the global flood? Everything above the line informs that below the line and without the upper part, you cannot get it right. I know, yes, I, I mean, I specialized in protozoa in my PhD work. And yeah, I can make a description of a protozoa and I can make observations of that sort, but when it comes to drawing conclusions and making sense out of it all, there is no purpose or meaning available below the dotted line. You just have facts, nothing more. So this is what, if, if uh, you're going to have a student in a class and, and you're going to teach them from below the dotted line alone, what are they going to be receiving? Well, in the beginning matter. That's all that existed. Well, what's that going to do? Well, you're going to have no mind. You have no life. You have no person. Everything is going to have to proceed by chance. And you're going to make the claim that chemical spontaneously formed life forms minds and forms persons. I, I, I guess I'm, I'm just maybe a little tired of pretend knowledge. No one knows how that could possibly happen, even though that's what every student in secular schools are taught. I'm ready to protest. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, if I went through the upper above the dotted line and said this entire universe was perfectly created, it was intelligently designed, humanly corrupted, will be divinely culminated, and will be eternally recreated, every one of those would be rejected. True. Not a single one of those are acceptable. It just eliminated everything God told us. And can they get it right without that? No. Not possible. Wouldn't, <laughs> wouldn't Jesus come today and say, how can you academia possibly teach biology, physics, history, environmental studies, geology, and other natural and physical sciences without Jesus explaining 
You're mistaken. The Christian position, in fact, starts another way. It starts with a life, it starts with a mind, and it starts with a person. Isn't it more logical to consider that that mind, that life, that person could come up with other minds, other lives, and other persons? And we don't need the dice. We need intelligent design. And the, where I'm heading for is the task then that we have is to determine whether or not the matter, the life, and the personal beings demonstrate intelligence. Because the key difference between the Christian and the secular point of view is not one is natural and the other is supernatural. The minute you do that, you lose. The difference is, does the product indicate evidence of having been guided or does it have evidence of being unguided or chaotic? Therefore, you have the possibility of a scientific investigation. If you can determine a test and a way to identify something that is truly designed. Meanwhile, the, the reviewing review, the results of the position below the line is humans are an integral part of nature, the result of unguided evolutionary change. We can discover no divine purpose of providence for the human species. In other words, with cosmic accidents. That's all you can get when you have observation and experimentation without anything about the dotted line. And so my biology text that I used on one occasion, you are an animal and share a common heritage with earthworms. My students were elated, they thought, they just added a lot of dignity to their lives. <laughs> Meanwhile, above the dotted line, humanity, uniquely created, spiritually fallen, morally accountable, wouldn't that be wonderful today? Divinely redeemed, eternally destined, all of which would be rejected by academia today. When Jesus once again come and say you are mistaken. I don't hate scientists, hey. <laughs> I am one. I I I what I but I have a, a passion in a heart for young people who are coming out as products without any hope at all. Because they're victims of a worldview that is a dead end, it will lead them nowhere. Meanwhile, the view of humanity in biblical theism, God created man in his own image, male and female, he created them, or you made him a little lower than the heavenly beings, crowned him with glory and honor, you made him ruler over the works of your hands. Huge difference in perspective of understanding humanity, created in the image of God. So if we look at the whole idea of human observation and experimentation in the areas of God, of, of man, universe, time, the existence of God and his revelation totally informed that worldview regarding those three items. And without God's revelation, it's not possible to accurately and fully understand them. What's the consequence of suppressing the truth about God? Remember that was where we started. The first thing you do is get rid of God. For even though, this is Romans chapter one again, for even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile. In their speculations, their foolish heart was darkened, professing to be wise, they became fools. Caught up here. The problem with eliminating God is it can't be isolated. 
Once you do that, you have created a domino effect. Everything else starts to go as well. Here's, I'm quoting them. We are convinced that the time has passed for theism. Of course, we already covered that, no God. Religious humanists regard the universe as self-existing and not created. So there's no creation. There's no God, of course, there's gonna be no creation. Or man is just a part of nature and he has merged as a result of evolution. There's no image of God in humanity. Humanist finds that the traditional dualism of mind and body must be rejected. Death is the end of man's life. There's no life after death. You can't stop these things. Once you eliminate God, these are dominoes that keep falling. It becomes the whole position of the culture. Humanists declare unacceptable any supernatural source of human values. What did that do? Well, it took away all moral absolutes. The whole idea of what's right for you is not right for me. And uh, I have my truth, you have your truth. Everything is relative. There are more, but I stop with six. Man's religion is the product of his environment and his culture. It's just eliminated everything above the dot of line. And so we're back down below the dot of line. That's all we've got to work with. And that's science's dilemma. This didn't happen overnight. It did take time for this whole thing to, to, to develop across the globe. And I just, this is a very broad brush. And some of you who are really good in history and, uh, and culture will probably say that's too simplistic. But if you go back to the 17th century, you have a predominant concept of continuation of theism. Whether God is, is surviving, he's okay. Um, then you get into the uh, 18th century and you have emerging of the deism, a, an absentee God. Uh, may have started it all, but then he disappeared and he's gone forever. Uh, and then 19th century with Darwin, you have naturalism. Uh, a nature-centered mindset and so forth. You take that sequence and move it over to the 20th and the 21st century. 20th century integrated naturalism and secular humanism virtually into all thought. It doesn't really matter if you're in literature, it doesn't matter if you're in sociology, it doesn't matter if you're in physics. It was integrated into all thought. All of academia being saturated with that kind of thought and the final, the result is what today in the 21st century, we're reaping the result. We are a culture of materialism. Kent is uh, you know, asking questions, uh, how can each of the disciplines, I, I would, I, 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 I particularly have a, a passion in this area because I once upon a time was an academic dean of a college. And I was responsible for the hiring of a faculty. It was a Christian organ, uh, uh, college, but how difficult was it for me as an academic dean to find a man or a woman to become who had enough knowledge of the Bible and God's revelation to have any impact on their training in their discipline. No thought seemed, well, yeah, they're Christians, but I want a professor who understands the revelation of God and understands biology, understands physics, understands literature, understands and can show an integration of knowledge. You try it sometime to find people like that. It's very difficult. How did this all happen? If, if I'm right that this came across to centuries of time, well, everything above the dotted line was gradually get, gotten rid of. God was eliminated from intellectual thought. The personal revelation of Jesus was ignored. The special revelation of the Bible was rejected. And so the consequence is you have nothing but below the line. Everything above the line has been gotten rid of. And so the universe must be self-existent. 
and nature must have arisen by chance. Sound familiar? Human reason was then regarded as autonomous. And with final authority in all matters related to truth. You couldn't, in fact, claim there was truth outside of human reason. So that's the only knowledge that's left for academia. And our courses today are built on that limited knowledge. The Bible warns about that. Of course, if you don't have a Bible, if you don't, God doesn't exist, then this doesn't matter to you. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will direct your paths. Don't be impressed with your own wisdom. Instead, fear the Lord and turn your back on evil. In fact, the Proverbs say, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. So you eliminate that, and you have no starting point. But then culture had to make that position the new normal. And so when Mao said, all knowledge comes from experience, yeah, everybody jumped on board. Seemed that way anyway. But if he's right, and all reality consists of only, that all reality has to consist of only three subjects that anyone can know something about humanity the physical universe in time. You can't know it exhaustively at all because you've eliminated everything relating to revelation in those. So only what humans can observe, even only what humans can experiment with, can you then have as, a, as your experience. That's the only teacher. That's the only source of truth. I mean, it's still a question. I, I, years ago, I was taught this, this idea. Uh, and, and I started thinking, Hmm, how long would I have to live to know that I'm going to live forever? Think about it. Obviously, you can't know until at least it's too late. Unless it's revealed to you, your human observation and experimentation is going to be fairly limited in that regard. So what's the position I'm advocating here? Not all knowledge comes from experience, but for the Christian, all knowledge comes from experience and revelation. About four centuries ago, in the time of Francis Bacon and associates, science made a rather fatal decision Let's abandon Aristotle's idea of final causes, the notion that there's purpose and meaning in nature. Science would have lead the notion of purpose and meaning to philosophy and theology, everything above the line. What something is for, or ask the question why, and that need not trouble science any longer. What was left for science was just a mechanistic view of nature. The result was a divided field of knowledge. The watershed was the method of arriving at truth. Absolutes an antithesis disappeared below the line, the red line. And for about 200 years, this uneasy truth, the mechanics truth of science and the purpose meaning truth of philosophy theology coexisted. Above the red line is the non-rational and the non-logical. It's everything is existential experience, a leap of faith. Below the line, you have the rational, the logical. Particulars, yeah, only, 
but no purpose or meaning. The person who impacted me a great deal is Dr. Francis Schaeffer with a variety of his books, The God Who Is There, He Is There, He Is Not Silent, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Darwin came along. He broke the truce. He did what any reasonable and logical person would have concluded. There is no detectable purpose or meaning in biology. It doesn't actually exist. Design is only apparent. And the people above the line have nothing to say about it because that's simply a leap of faith. That's illogical, that's irrational. We're the only ones who control truth. Douglas Fudema, is that I'm saying that right, Fudema? Darwin's lasting importance was precisely his banishment of purpose from life. However, <laughs> Bilodowski disagrees with him. He's going to go back to Francis Bacon 200 years before that, and he says, design died not at the hands of the 19th century evolutionary biology, but at the hands of the mechanical philosopher two centuries earlier. Remember that fatal decision? We're gonna let you folks up there take care of the purpose of meeting. Down here, we just take care of the facts. And that's Dembski's view where it all began, of a divided field of knowledge. So we have today methodological naturalism. And many of you who are in this group know about this, but the doctrine that says that for the explanation to be scientific, it must be naturalistic. In other words, it must come from below the line. That is, it must only appeal to entities, causes, events, and processes contained within the material universe. Any appeal to other causes is necessarily false. It's the methodology that's standing in the way of intelligent design today. Not the facts, not good people, but the fact that you dare not cross that line if you want to keep your job, if you want to get a grant. You must toe the line, it seems to me. Francis Schaeffer said it way back in the 1980s, what was happening. He said, if rationalistic man wants to deal with the really important things of human life, such as purpose, significance, the validity of love, he must discard rational thought about them and make a giant national, non-rational leap of faith. Those are not really true things. We have truth down here in the lower level. Michael Behe, of course, has been a, rather a champion. He may not be consistent with everything Jesus said, uh, what we believe here, but he is certainly making a mark when it comes to what I'm talking about here uh, tonight. In his book, Darwin Devolves, uh, he has said some uh, pretty, pretty powerful things. He's a biochemist and uh, when it first came out, I took a, a little bit of notes from a publication that talked about it, reviewed it. And Dr. B, he says, originally was led to believe in Darwin's theory, not for strong evidence for it, but for sociological reasons. That simply was the way educated people were expected to think these days. It has been, he's talking about natural selection with random mutation. <clears throat> it's been wildly overrated. It's incapable of producing much biological change at all. Is there any kind of a chink in the materialistic armor? I think so. He makes this comment in his book as well. Humans have evolved, he quotes from a, a book, 
a sense of self that's unparalleled in its complexity. All of us would read right over that and take it for granted. You know, so what? He changed the sentence to humans have a sense of self that's unparalleled in its complexity. And he said, have I lost any information by deleting the word evolved? And he said, absolutely none. The word evolved in the sentence carries no information and is based on zero scientific data. Yet it creates a unified front to the public. What it is, is a pretense of knowledge. There's no knowledge in that word at that point in that sentence. There's no knowledge there. But it needs to be there to provide a continuing front of the subject matter. And the, he goes on in his book, page 269, if materialism is true, by the way, let me, let me comment about something else before I jump into that statement there. As you know, if you study the history of science, that Western culture um, was where, where science really blossomed. I'm not talking about the beginning. Where why, why, why did science take root in Western culture? Well, because the Judeo Christian intelligent creation meant that nature would be rational, nature would be predictable, nature would be, nature would be understandable. But you have an intelligent source for it, not random chance. But having abandoned God, having abandoned intelligent creation, nature is just a product of blind chance. And there is no longer any reason to expect it to be rational or expect it to be predictable or expect it to be understandable. But besides what we call a bind, our minds, is only a byproduct of irrational evolutionary forces. How could we have free will to make choices when we come from an irrational foundation? And so the literature is full of discussion about whether or not our minds are real or not. Free will, many writers say, is only an illusion. Some are suggesting that what we are all experiencing is simply some grand computer simulation. Do you see what's happening? They pulled the rug right out from under themselves. What they thought was rationality. It turns out they have no basis for rationality at all. Is anything real? So B, he comments, if materialism is true, if all that exists is the matter and energy studied in ordinary physics classes, then there is no such thing as a real mind. Confronted with that dilemma, there are two choices, either affirm materialism and deny your own mind or affirm your mind and deny materialism. I feel that one of the great, great contributions of Behe's book is one chapter where he ignores all the philosophy, ignores all the uh, discussion and debate about worldviews and so forth, and simply says, what does biochemistry come to find when it studies living forms? I cannot possibly utilize this. It's a whole chapter of, it just simply causes, in a sense, the here to stand up in the back of your head. It, it, it's, it's so amazing that the cell, like plant, he uses as an illustration. I mean, there may be three pages on this one. Plant hoppers, gears in the backs of their legs. They never could quite figure out what they were. They're bumps on the back of their legs. As it turns out, they are gears in the back because the, the, the plant hopper needs to jump. But if it's, the legs aren't coordinated, he loses the power and he loses 
Do we lose the picture? Uh, it, 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 they, they, they simply fall around. They have to have perfect coordination. So what they have is gears on the back. And they call them gears anyway. They, it, it claims that they are spinning at 50,000 teeth per second. Coordinating both hind legs and enabling a high speed takeoff and jumping hundreds of times its body length. Random mutation and natural selection did that. The vertebrate eye, of course, even Darwin was made, you know, troubled by the complexity of the eye and everything else. And then again, I can't go into all the detail, but it's often been said by evolutionists that if in fact the eye was created by the intelligent designer, he really screwed up because it's wired backwards. You've got the optic nerve in front of the retina. <laughs> And, and therefore you have a blind spot. And that's a really bad design. Until they began to look at it further and found that there are fiber optics that run from the front to the cones and the rods in the back. It actually gives far better sight than if it were done the other way around. Again, look for yourself, I, I can't. Uh, now the discovered magneto, magnetotactic uh, bacteria. Uh, they looked under the microscope and the bacteria were always went one direction. They thought, well, they're attracted to light. So they put the light on the other side and they still went the other way. Oh, they, they, they're trying to figure out why certain bacteria have movement in a certain direction until they put a magnet up there. You can take them any direction you want. And, and, uh, what he goes through is two pages. Try to develop the genetics of that and all the necessary programming that would be required to control all of their production. They have to have a certain kind of magnetic iron that they incorporated into the back. We're talking about a bacteria that you have to look under the microscope to even see. And, and they, they incorporate that. They can manufacture, they make them into little cubicles. They, they, they put them in a, in a fold of a membrane because they're toxic. So they don't, that doesn't kill them. And um, the, the detail that he goes into in that chapter, it just causes anyone to, to shake their head. How could this be? Bacterial locomotion, on a solid surface, how, I mean, how do bacteria move? Well, they have a flagellum, but not all of them do. What if you're a bacteria without a flagellum, then you can't move, or you're not in a liquid, so that wouldn't work anyway. How would you move on a solid surface? And they do. And then what they're discovering is, what do single cell creatures use to move? An early conjecture about a gliding bacteria named Mycococcus was that it moved by shooting slime from nozzles at its rear end, relying on the kickback to propel it forward. Well, that would have been enchanting, but it turned out to be wrong. Instead, new information points to something equally fantastic. The cell is essentially a tank, we're talking about a military tank, that employs a motor to power moving circular treads. Researchers placed a fluorescent tag on a particular protein in the tread of the bacteria, and in the microscope, they saw a Dave Gold ribbon that ran the length of the cell turning as the creature moved along. It had tracks on each side that were moving the bacteria, a cell, a bacterial cell. We're not talking about some giant high on the evolutionary scale. We're talking about a bacteria. The authors of the research paper were amazed and he quotes them, astoundingly, these helices appear to rotate within the cell cytoplasm as the cells move forward. Unlike military tanks in our everyday world, the cell isn't heavy enough to generate much friction. So how does the bacterium grip the surface, the hard surface? That's where the slime comes in. Excreted polysaccharide sticks to the surface as well as to the bacterium, giving it traction. Minor, or excuse me, motor proteins use the tread as an internal highway carrying a load of other proteins whose job apparently is to push against and distort the membrane making little bumps on the surface. These that push on the slime moving the cell forward. The cargo proteins hop off the 
treads. Once the motor loses contact with the surface, it circles back around and add, goes to the back end of the treads. Can you understand then why Behe would say, as biochemistry research continues, the more marvels and the regulatory complexity is more, the more regulatory complexity is discovered and the more and more deeply into life teleology can be seen to penetrate. As complexity piles on complexity, a palpable restlessness has gripped the field of evolutionary biology. He's right. So what's happening, he says this, random mutation and natural selection can't possibly accomplish anything remotely like what has been ascribed to them. In other words, the emperor has no clothes. Consequently, the actual illusion is a thoroughly modern one. The illusion that Darwin's or any other proposed evolutionary mechanism can account for the elegance of life, their supposed power was all in our heads. And so we have, if you're not familiar with that, go to your website and look up descentfromdarwin.org. And there you will find that exit from Darwinian mechanism to explain things. I mean, we you can't see it because of the smallness of print, but we're not talking we're talking about Woods Hole. We're talking about University of, of, uh, of Georgia. We're talking about Texas A&M. We're talking about uh, universities and colleges all over the world where there are 1,000 currently, I just looked it up, 1,260 scientists, mostly with advanced degrees who have signed the statement below. We are skeptical of claims for the ability of random mutation and natural selection to account for the complexity of life. Careful examination of the evidence for Darwinian theory should be encouraged. Not exactly like a landslide. I suspect that many of those people uh, are already um, uh, not lost the word when you when you what? no that retired. They're uh, they've been granted tenure. They probably because at that point it would be difficult to lose your job. I have been teaching around the country and I oftentimes teach other subjects, but sometimes creation and evolution. It's not uncommon for me for having high school biology teachers that would come up to me in private after I'd spoken and say to me, I sure agree with what you had to say, but I would never let anybody hear no. They're afraid. You don't cross the establishment of power. Can we ever hope to get back to a united field of now? I'm almost done here. Can purpose ever be restored to science? Only if we can deal with the materialism, the methodological materialism, would there be renewed hope? And recent work by a wide variety of scholars in many different disciplines has converged upon the notion that a rigorously articulated concept of design can be introduced fruitfully into possible scientific suggestions or explanations. In other words, can we figure out a way to get design intelligence to be recognized as valid below the line? And the, one of the hopefuls is the concept of design uh, inference that I have up there now. Making design inferences are already an essential and uncontroversial part of various scientific evidences like forensics or crypto, cryptography or remember SETI. They're making a design inference. 
from the observable evidence. There are two essentials for inferring a rational detection of intelligence. One is complexity and the other is specification. Sometimes referred to as specified complexity. Dembski is really a major source for this suggestion. What does this mean? For example, it's already being used, completely accepted, it's not even controversial as evidence uh, in NASA's uh, search for extraterrestrial uh, intelligence. Uh, re receiving signals from outer space. Well, how in the world are they gonna know whether they come from an intelligence source or from a random source? Because there's gobs and gobs of them out there. But you go to the website, go to SETI's website. Here's what they'll say. We're looking for the existence of coded information on the signal. You may recall the science fiction film Contact, starring Jodie Foster, in which they assumed that the source, uh, they, they received finally, it was a replay of, 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 of SETI, uh, and they received a signal repeating a sequence of prime numbers from two through 101. It can only be divided by one or the number itself. All when that thing, and what did they conclude? It must have come from an intelligent source. That's inferred or intelligence. The, the evidence is such that the conclusion you draw is just like it is in science, except that it's not materialism only. And so if you have complex and specified information, we generally will infer that that's the result of intelligence. We look at Mount Rushmore out in Western South Dakota. Is that the result of millions of years of wind and water erosion? No, we would infer from that that that's not a result of chance. It's the result of intelligence and it's been designed. And everybody agrees with that. Go to the DNA molecule, the structure and language of DNA. You have the sequence along the length of the double helix. And those are letters, chemical letters that are forming words. Four of them, ATCG, just to keep it simple. Three letter words are being formed from those four letters in sequence, creating sentences that make up a gene, genes that make up unique blueprints, one for each plant and animal species that's ever lived. This is specified complexity. Time covered it in the idea of the genome as a book with around 3 billion letters. Yet so small, there are trillions of copies inside each one of us, not even a metaphor, it's literally true. What does that really mean? It takes more letters than in 900 Bibles in precise sequence to blueprint a baby. And we have the audacity to stand before university students and tell them that's a result of chance. And nobody dare protest. Even last week, Bill Gates, DNA is like a computer program. I'm not sure you'd accept his authority. But DNA is like a computer program, but far, far more advanced than any software we've ever created. Oh, they don't evolve software? No, software, evidently, Microsoft has to hire intelligent men and women in order to come up with software because it's too highly ordered, too highly sequenced in order for it to possibly exist. Why would you say a universe would need that? Software like DNA is so highly ordered, so information rich, that it could not have arisen by chance, but is created. What happens? The question is asked in some of the recent literature. If design inference applied to certain natural phenomena yields the conclusion that there is an intelligent cause that might transcend our universe, there seems to be an illegitimate double standard operative in barring such a conclusion when design inferences are otherwise scientifically acceptable. 
only methodological naturalism stands in the way. It's the claim that it's the only source of truth. Philip Johnson, in his book, Darwin and Trial, why not consider the possibility that life is what it is so evidently seems to be, the product of creative intelligence? Science would not come to an end because the task would remain of deciphering the languages in which genetic information is communicated and in general finding out how the whole system works. What scientists would lose, however, is not an inspiring research program, but the illusion of total mastery of nature. They would have to face the possibility that beyond the natural world, there is a further reality which transcends science. Could we ever possibly pray and hope that we could ever see that diagram again without the dividing line between the two fields of knowledge? But I'm going to go one step further to point out if, in fact, it ever happens that inferred intelligence can be acceptable as evidence and it points to an intelligent creator, the ministry that I'm president of specializes in taking it from there to point out not that a creator exists, but who it is. The, the most powerful and trusted historical sources, the New Testament records of the person of Jesus Christ, clearly supports any reasonable examination that he is, in fact, God. Just because people don't know the evidence doesn't mean it's not true. And I would take it then from there, so we can take it from that step. And in my, my, my view is that instead of then, if we could ever get to the point where design is acceptable as, a, as evidence because of the design inference, we could see major revival across the nation. That's what I'm praying for. Why? Because now the conversation can include God. Though there'll be a great deal of ignorance, people said, who's that? Well, how would you ever know? You can't believe the Bible, it's a bunch of junk until you look at the evidence. And so you could create tremendous wide discussion once again, open field that you can talk about God in front of people, including scientists. So my, my hope is that we could be here and do this someday no longer mistaken, understanding the scriptures and the power of God. I both commented about this would open up a research program of immense possibilities to detect design, understand its workings and apply it for the good of humanity. You can't see that now, but I'll, I'll, I'll read it to you. And uh, it could open public private conversations that have immense evangelistic potential for spiritual revival in the scientific community and society. And I'm wondering if the Christian community, the church, the parachurch, and the TCCSA is praying for and would be prepared if such a thing ever happened. It would better be. Anyway, questions and answers if you would like to ask them. I got a question here. Well, uh, I'd like to preface it with something that just occurred to me. One of the, we have a school people have is Jesus and the baby did not create all that we see around when he was birth or a baby by a manger. He existed before as the son of God before he was incarnate. That's one of them. It just occurred to me that people have a problem seeing Jesus not connected to the creator of the world. He was just lying there as a baby. <laughs> he, had a, he had a son of God nature that was 
incarnate uh, before the sludge birth. Uh, here's, a, here's a question. Concerning Francis Schaeffer's presumption that a leap of Christian faith is irrational, is everything above the division line graph to which you alluded to be misconsidered irrational and illogical? If you are part of the community below the line, yes. Uh, no, not for people of faith, uh, absolutely not. And, and again, Keep in mind, I made broad statements. Is every person below the line the same? Of course not. There is a quite a diversity of people. Uh, there are believers below the line. They're not really integrated sometimes, their faith into their work, but nevertheless, they are believers uh, and Christian believers. Um, and But yes, there, there is, uh, Within the methodological approach, the anything that you derive, what Schaefer calls the upper story, has no validity when it comes to truth. It, it's simply not possible because we can't validate it, we can't verify it uh, down here in our lower level. So that that my simple answer would be, yeah, I think. Uh, that would be the view if, if you were really a part of the establishment that believes that they have a monopoly on truth. Can you make, I know it's kind of a broad brush, but can you make a general application of the divine mind with the current climate change issues? Because it seems to me like uh, a lot of the below the line is really intruding into the whole discussion. And there's no talk about God and his control over climate change, for instance. Um, I'm, I'm trying to grab the your, your question. Uh, say, could you clarify for me again? Uh, the, what's the question? It seems to be like climate change people are jumping in with all of the below the line stuff. Sure. Ignoring anything about the line because they're so entrenched in their evolutionary backgrounds that only a, only a lot, well, there's actually a lot of climatologists who don't believe in all of the nonsense, but the preponderance is very strong. Uh, yes, yeah, so I was told I'm supposed to repeat the question so everybody could get that who's uh, appearing at uh, live stream. Um, the question is about climate change and the a concept of green energy and on and on and on, all those things related to the environment, to the earth, um, are, are, are they simply operating from the perspective of, of the values that are derivable below the, the lines that they're talking about, human observation, human experimentation. Um, I'm not even sure that that's the major issue. To me, the major issue is the politicizing of it all. Uh, it has to do with control. It, it has to do with power. And, and uh, sure, I think that's a factor. They, they don't have the perspective. Uh, remember I said the, eventually the, the, the universe is going to be recreated. Uh, no idea of anything like that. We are the ones who control our entire destiny. Uh, we, in a sense, play God and it's scary we do and so people get fearful and they say we're all going to drown or we're all going to this is going to happen to us and so forth they have no perspective when it comes to the information that would come from the revelation of god um, somebody else yes francis bacon had an interesting fellow okay Do you think, do you think he's the father of the scientific method? Yeah, the method. So do you kind of blame him, or is he not so much to blame as other people? Well, they, Francis Bacon is the question here. Did, did he, am I blaming him for the, the direction that science took? Uh, no, there were you know, lots of other people, colleagues and so forth, but he did have a lot of influence. And uh, uh, I, I, I'm a reader, keep in mind, not 
I, I don't know that uh, I'm an expert in, in the question you're asking at all, uh, but uh, it was probably well intentioned. Uh, as, as somehow there was a tension between uh, theology and the emerging science uh, and understanding, whether it be uh, Copernicus or whatever it might have been, uh, they thought this might be a way to coexist. Uh, and you have your truth, we have our truth. But the problem with that is, is the minute this truth below the line takes full maturity, and then Darwin comes along and says, we can explain everything in biology by natural means. We don't need your story anymore. We don't need your information. In fact, your information is false. It's not true anymore. Well, and that's another, whether Darwin used the scientific method. He, he did make observations and, you know, he, he at least in his publications was willing to acknowledge and admit that there were areas that really bugged him. He, he, he didn't understand and he didn't know how to explain it. And in fact, it bothered him a lot. And he admitted that. Uh, I don't think we have the transparency and the honesty like that in many publications today. What can the average person do to help get rid of that line? How can the average person get rid of the line that stands between the upper and the lower uh, levels of knowledge? Um, uh, I, I think uh, in our uh, families, we can start there. Uh, if, if, if our families are not being uh, taught to respect uh, the revelation of God, uh, and, and, and it seems when they go to school and the parent never talks to their, their son or daughter about what they're learning in school, uh, how would you, if the adults can't integrate the two, how in the world are your kids going to integrate the two? And you end up finding that over and over again, young people who are not given any kind of help in orienting in regard to the issues of science, what it claims, and what they hear from home, usually end up going to the university and being destroyed. Uh, their faith is, is no longer valid, and, and therefore they walk away. And we see what 70% in recent polls of young people going to secular universities walk away from their Christian faith, even if they grew up in a Christian home. So if we aren't doing it at home, and, and of course, uh, can I say something controversial? I, over and over and again, I'm asked to sometimes counsel people about where's a good school and on and on and on. Uh, where should we have our son or daughter go and so forth? But when the invitation comes from Harvard that their son or daughter can get in there, reason goes to the wind because they want that feather in their hat that their son or daughter is going to Harvard where they will destroy his faith. It's an amazing thing that Christians are paying universities to destroy their sons and daughters. I don't mean 100 percent. There's ways to deal with that. For example, there are Christian groups on most university campuses. If your son or daughter wants to have around themselves an influence that would be supportive of their faith, they can find it. And they should. But if they don't, I can almost guarantee you it's not going to come out well. Uh, so it starts at home, would be my, my position. Do we understand what's at stake here? And then from there on, why not support uh, education at the elementary, the secondary, and the college university level that does honor the, the total truth rather than only the position from below the line? Uh, they feel the pressure if enough people begin to say, oh, we're not going to buy it into your view of education. We want to see the total information that's available, not just the big on the line stuff. So that, that's just a quick answer, but that, that we've got to, we're in an age of protest. <laughs> Quit taking it. Protest. Uh, yes. Eighteenth century. Yeah, seventeenth century. 
Um, so my comment is there seems to be a big connection between theism and Freemason. That's what I've seen. And that makes sense because Freemason believes in the great architect of the universe, their God. I think there's a big connection. I think Freemason is pushed to be Certain things like unity and so forth also merge people together under the idea that there is this creator power that usually not personal. Uh, and uh, that's how they find unity is in, 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 in that view. It's a theistic you're concept. Not, you're not going to pray to the great architect of the universe. He's a theistic guy. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, I'm no expert in which the question you ask about whether uh, Freemasonry uh, reflects the 18th century deism or not. And of course, as you know, to avoid Christianity and its influence, uh, the left wants to always identify all the founding fathers of our constitution and so forth as deists, not as real Christians. And uh, that's an ongoing debate uh, for, for people. We may be getting a feel here just a little bit. Any other, anyone else would like to comment or, or, or raise a question? You were given a sheet. Uh, when you, uh, were, I mean, you're probably sitting. I think I remember seeing you spread those out. If you have a comment um, or raise another question or something, I, I will between TCCSA and I will receive those and be happy to uh, work with those if there's something we can do to help with uh, questions that you have. Or if you would like to, I, I commented before that <clears throat> I've turned a lot to writing. I find as I get older, it's harder and harder to do the rigors of travel and going coast to coast and speaking and so forth. But I, I do newsletters and, and on, on apologetics, especially, and on theological subjects. And one of them is called the paraclete, if any of you know theology, that's the word in the Greek for Holy Spirit. I'm not the Holy Spirit. Uh, but, I, but I am an advocate for the truth of the Christian faith, then for the paraclete, which is what the Holy Spirit's function is. And then I do something called apologetics. Uh, it's a, a mostly apologetics on, on uh, in the footsteps of Jesus. Uh, what do we know archaeologically about that? Or uh, this one that's coming out uh, this week will be on uh, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre uh, and other kinds of things. What do we know from archaeology? So I dig in there and find what do we know about these things at this point? How much confidence can we have in that area? So if, if these are free and on the table over here. There's a uh, sign up sheet. And you know, it's a gimmick, right? Uh, no, we're, we're a Christian evangelical ministry doing evangelism and trying to help in the cause of Christian evolution and a variety of other issues that face America and face the world. And uh, we have a, 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 an evangelist that goes to Russia, is very impactful on the education of all Russians in which he has written a textbook that has been adopted by Russia for all their schools in the secondary level. And it's basically the Christian message. And uh, he's, uh, so Oleg Boskrasensky is one of our uh, evangelistic staff. And, and so he has a blog where he continually reports. He goes five times a year, three weeks at a time, and goes through the, what? Uh, 17 time zones, I think from one end of Russia to the other, 11 times, I forget what it is. Uh, and so uh, if you want to you know, know about it, we, I could say our office is in Edina, and uh, we've been at this now for, this is our 42nd year. So we've been around a while. Uh, and if you want to find out more, uh, check it out. My main, my main book is Surprised by Faith, My Own Conversion from um, my own agnosticism to faith in Jesus Christ and transform my life. And uh, the evidence that changed my mind regarding God, the Bible, Jesus, and faith. 
And so uh, this has been you know, what 350,000 copies have been distributed so far. And so uh, check it out if uh, you want to use it for a class or for teaching or something like that. Thank you for indulging me a little bit here. Uh, and I pray that uh, something I said would be helpful. Thank you.